God bless you. Come and bless us and lead us in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. just get everyone to open your things now because that's a bit awkward we get this out of the way now going to start us off with a familiar scripture verse um, and we just keep this most in mind this verse in mind as I continue um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 26 for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes now last year on Father's Day I was given the honour of communion as well either I did a really good job or it's just taken me this long to get back through the cycle, I don't know. But you may remember I had a little Judah up with me last year and we had a prop with us, a little yellow truck. Well, um, I shared how the gift that I gave, well, sorry, it wasn't mine. It was his grandparents that gave him um, on his birthday just a few days before um, reflects the gift that the Father gave to us in his son, Jesus Christ. Um, and I had him come stand up with me and he tipped the water over, everyone tells me. But it was a really good example, I think, because he actually plays with the car still. So the point was that we hold on to the gift that the Lord gave us and um, we really cherish, you know, Especially Father's Day, we sort of recognise um, God the Father especially and um, the love that he shared abroad when he gave his son. Well, as you all know, as every year that passes, we get a new birthday and Judah had a new birthday a couple of days ago and he got a new present from his other grandparents. It was a another truck sort of thing this time. Uh, this time it was a digger, an earth mover. And as you may have guessed, he spent all day playing with it, digging balloons and wrapping paper and people's feet or whatever else was on the ground. Uh, I won't get him up here to share because this time it has batteries. <laughs> so it makes a lot of noise. Um, but his grandparents who gave him the digger would no doubt have, no doubt have been pleased that it was received so well. Um, but as you know, if you've ever given a gift to somebody, sometimes it's not perhaps received so well. Maybe the person uh, doesn't understand what it is or, or how to use it or um, maybe they're just not interested, you know. Um, <clears throat> and I thought to myself, you know, with communion, how could I share a message that um, really touches everyone and everyone kind of understands? You know? And most of us here, I'd expect, are all saved. Um, and probably been in the church for a long time, like myself. And we've been through many communion messages over the years. Um, and we think we think we understand sometimes, but we all need a bit of a refresher. And I'm just going to start at the beginning and just take us on a bit of a journey through the scriptures again. Um, beginning with Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 to 6. Uh, the Bible reads, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. So that was verse 2 and, and then down to verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And I'm going to go to the book of Luke now from chapter 2 and read the account of the announcement of Jesus' birth. 
beginning from eight. Now they were in the same country, shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Saviour, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. I often think in maybe Australian slang, goodwill towards men means she'll be right, I've got it. Um, and, and in doing so, <clears throat> John 3.16, we all know the passage, um, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We're all familiar with that and I'm sure at the time maybe this was actually like a real shock to people. Um, this was new. They all knew that there was a God in heaven that had a plan but they didn't all completely understand it. And if we read on in Luke, Jesus begins to grow up a little and he visits the temple with his family. From verse 43, chapter 2. When they had finished the days and they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother did not know it. But supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among the relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem, seeking him. Now it was that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. Firstly, three days looking through Kmart for your son is something of an ordeal. <laughs> um, and secondly, that phrase, um, but they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them, that really spoke to me uh, as the father of children. He, Jesus says the words, I must be about my father's business. I can imagine Joseph thinking, Am I not this boy's father and his, is he not about my business? Um, what is this that he's talking about? And there was some confusion there maybe where people just didn't understand what Jesus' mission really was at that point in time. But there did come a time where Jesus began to minister as an adult and um, he visited the temple as was his custom and they asked him to speak. Luke again, chapter 4, verse 16. I'll go from verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now, that message may not have been received so excitedly by some. And I like to think that maybe in direct proportion to those who had a higher awareness of their own sin, maybe, their own need for a saviour, um, they would probably likely find more value in those words of Jesus. And back in Corinthians, this is years now after Jesus, 
And uh, there's a church in Corinth, and Paul is writing to the Corinthians, and he's addressing a few things. Um, the Lord's Supper is one of those things. Um, I won't go specifically into his address, but um, he does write, uh, chapter 11, verse 29, For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. And looking also um, at chapter 9, um, from verse 26, Paul says, Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Now I follow the train in my Bible. There's a little note there that says at that verse, it's connected to another verse, which happens to be Jeremiah um, chapter 6, verse 30. Just give me a moment. And considering um, Paul's comment that he must subject himself lest he uh, be judged as well after preaching to others, the Old Testament um, speaks to this. Um, <coughs> reading from verse 27, chapter 6, Jeremiah. I have set you as an assayer and as a fortress among my people that you may know and test their way. They are all stubborn rebels, walking as slanderers. They are bronze and iron. They are all corruptors. The bellows blow fiercely. The lead is consumed by the fire. The smelter refines in vain, for the wicked are not drawn off. People will call them rejected silver, because the Lord has rejected them. And I believe Paul there was telling his audience the importance of the Christian message doesn't finish at the cross when you accept Jesus. It continues. And um, I thought of that scripture in Lamentations where it says the mercies of God are new every morning. Just like we have birthdays every year and we get a presence every year, um, the Lord is provided for us consistently and constantly. And uh, in Jude it says, contend for the faith once given for all. The Lord Jesus was only given once and he was given for all. But it also says to keep the love of God in your hearts and to not let it depart from you. And I feel Paul's concern sometimes in Corinthians there is, is about the people not giving up and continuing on and always keeping in mind the gift that God gave to us and the importance of it and letting it be real to us every morning no matter how many times we take the emblems here the body of the Lord Jesus and the blood that represents his new covenant it means the same to us every time but it never means any less and um, just as I close this out in prayer um, I want us all to consider what it means to us and um, take it in your own time. Dear Lord, we come before you today. We thank you, Father God, uh, for that which you have sent to us, Jesus Christ, your Son. Lord, we recognise that our own selves, we have put ourselves in a position where we fall short of your glory. We sung this morning, show me your glory, Lord, and it's only by the blood of the Lord Jesus that covers our sin that we can approach the throne of glory, God. And so, Lord, we want to recognise that blood and that broken body of Jesus and his sacrifice that covers our sin, God. And we ask, Lord, that you would apply that blood over us, cover our sin, God. 
and let us into your glory, Father. Amen. Thank you for sharing that. That's wonderful. Can we appreciate this mighty man? Just want to speak this blessing over the fathers, and then I'm going to get Pastor Gary White to come and share uh, for the next half an hour or so um, um, what the Lord's put on his heart in regards to fathers and fatherhood and a wonderful Father's Day message. And... Um, I wasn't sure how it was going to be coming back all the, all the hours of flying uh, with being even in church this morning. So it's wonderful to just come and be able to sit and be blessed. But I want to speak a blessing over uh, the fathers here this morning. Uh, Genesis chapter 26. I just want to read some things here before I get Pastor Gary up. Uh, to share Genesis chapter 26, verse 23, 24, and 25. And I want to just share briefly uh, about the importance of uh, us as fathers, those who stand in that position of fatherhood. I want us to really understand the importance of that position. The Bible says uh, in verse 23 of Genesis uh, chapter 26, it says, then he went up from there to Beersheba. Now, Beersheba, the word Beersheba means uh, well of the seven oaths or the seven promises, the seven oaths. And so the Bible says here, and the Lord appeared to him the same night and said. Now, when he goes back to this place called Beersheba, which was a very, very, uh, very integral part, a specific prophetic place. The Lord appeared to him that same night and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for my servant Abraham's sake. So he built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord and he pitched his tent there and there Isaac's servants dug a well. Now, one thing that we need to understand is that God is a God of generations. He's not just God of Abraham. He's God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Whenever God visits a family, he doesn't just want to visit the first generation. He has a heart for multiple generations. The promise is unto you and to your children and to your children's children and to those who are far off. The Bible says, uh, you know, I'm speaking, uh, you know, I've never seen the righteous forsaken. No, he's what? Seed begging for bread. So we can see in scripture that God is a God of generations. And one thing that we need to understand about fatherhood and especially as fathers is that fathers tend to be like doorkeepers, doorkeepers. We have an opportunity as fathers to open the door for the Lord to come in and impact and influence generations. So at this point in time, Abraham had already gone home to be with the Lord. He had already died or rather went to Abraham's bosom. He had already left the scene and Isaac was by himself. And so uh, when Abraham was no longer there in the, uh, on the scene, God remembered the generations. And so God comes to Isaac. The son, and this is what he says. He says, and the Lord appeared to him that same night and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for my servant Abraham's sake. Let me just say this. 
we as men, when we maintain our spirituality and we maintain our prayer altar, we maintain the wells of salvation that God has built and dug in our lives. For our sake, God will visit our inheritance. Come on, somebody. He didn't say, I'm coming to you because of your prayer, because of your faithfulness, because of how you've been seeking God, because you've been going to church and you've been, you've been doing such a great job. No, because of your father, for his sake, I am now coming to visit you. How many of you know God can visit our children for our sake? I thank God because of Father, uh, Father Abraham and the, and, the, and, the, and the legacy that he left, the altar that he built, the wells that he dug. And now God was showing up because, for his sake while he, he's in heaven. He's already gone. For his sake, he did not leave his inheritance alone. He came and he showed up. And listen to this. He says, I'm going to give you fourfold blessing. He says, the Lord appeared to him the same night and he said, I am the God of your father Abraham. And he says, do, I am the God of your father Abraham. The first thing he says, do not fear. So number one blessing that God wants to visit upon the next generation is the faith or, or rather the blessing of no fear. Walking in faith instead of walking in fear. One thing about Abraham is that Abraham had no fear. That's, when he, that's the reason why he could raise up an army and go and fight those people who had taken over Lot, you know, captured Lot and captured Sodom and Gomorrah. And he would bring back. He was a fearless warrior. And so God says, this is the first blessing. I'll remove fear from your heart. You will not be afraid. Where your father was not afraid, you will not be afraid. Where he was not scared, where he was not intimidated, you will not be intimidated. He says, I am your God from today because I have entered the scene. You have nothing to fear from today. How many of you know when your protector, your covering leaves, he leaves you vulnerable and you feel sometimes a little bit scared. You feel as if you're, you're unsteady on your feet. Like, what am I going to do when daddy has already gone? Daddy paid for everything. Daddy provided. Daddy prayed for me. Now, what am I going to do? Daddy is gone. But God shows up and he says, I'm going to be your daddy. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. And he says, because I'm going to be your father, you do not have to be afraid of anything. You don't have to be afraid. Because I'm stepping in the position of your father. I will provide for you. I will look after you. I will pay your bills. You don't have to be worried. You don't have to be scared. You don't have to be intimidated by anything. I am showing up and I'm going to provide for you. Somebody shout hallelujah for that first blessing. It says, do not fear, for I am with you. I'm with you. Just like I was with your father, I am going to be with you. For his sake, because of his serving the Lord, I am going to be with you. And let me just say this. One with God is always a majority. If God be for us, who can be against us? When God tells you, I am with you, he's making a declaration to everything that is against you. That whatever it is that is against you, it can never prevail. The moment he takes your side, if God be for us, who? The moment he stands with you, your enemies are already defeated. Come on, somebody. They've already been overcome. They've already been pulled down. They've already been challenged. They've already been cut off. Hallelujah. So God is saying, I'm standing here not just to protect you, to provide for you, but I'm now going to be your bodyguard. I will fight on your behalf. I will challenge everything that is challenging you. I will fight everything that is fighting you. I am with you. Somebody say, I am with you. I am with you. That means you don't have to worry about who's against you. When God tells you, I am with you, you don't have to ever worry about who's against you. Because the moment he's with you, the battle has already been won. I am with you. Somebody say, he's with me. Then the Bible says, and I will bless you. I will bless you. One thing we know about the blessing of the Lord is that he maketh rich and adds no sorrow to it. Just like your father was so blessed, I will also visit you and I will bless you. The same blessing that he carries, the same blessing that was upon his head is going to be upon you. I will bless you. 
everywhere let me just say this anytime God says he will bless you what he's saying is that I will announce you around the world that's what he said to Abraham I will bless you and I will make your name great and in you shall all the nations of the earth be what be blessed so when God says I will bless you what he's telling you is that I'm gonna make you I will announce you to the earth when you show up, everybody will know you've showed up. That's what Abraham was. When Abraham showed up, people knew he had showed up. The kings came to meet him. Come on, somebody. That's why in verse 26, the Bible says, Then Abimelech came to him from Gerar. Who's Abimelech? The king. After he was blessed, Abimelech regarded. He didn't go to the king. The king came to him. Come on. I will bless you. Somebody say, I am blessed. I don't need to announce myself. God will announce me. Come on, somebody. He will announce me. The blessing of the Lord frees you from having to announce yourself. You, he, God himself will come. He will announce you before men. Now listen to this. I will multiply your descendants. The blessing of multiplication becomes his. God doesn't just want you to operate in addition. He wants you to operate in multiplication. You know what that means? That means that your problems or any issues that you have in front of you, God has already met those needs. If you may say, I have five loaves and two fish and I've got 5,000 men in front of me, not counting women and children. Whenever you find yourself in that situation, when God says, speaks multiplication over your life, that means you have stepped into the overflow. Not only will the needs be met, but you'll have 12 baskets full left over. Because God is a God of multiplication. He says, I'll multiply you. In other words, any issue that comes up, you will have the resource to meet it. Come on. Somebody say multiplication. May God move you from addition to multiplication. Amen. He says, and I will bless you and I will multiply your descendants. And he says, it's for my Abraham's or for my servant Abraham's sake. And when he heard this, the Bible says he built an altar there. And he called on the name of the Lord. And I pray that this will be the last blessing that God will give your descendants, even as men and women that have, have, have really stood in that position, that God will allow your children to have their own altar. That means that they will have their own relationship with God. It's not just them depending, Isaac depending on the altar of Abraham. After God spoke this, he said he went and he raised up his own altar. His own altar. And God will cause your children to have their own altar. He will cause them to pray like you prayed. He will cause them to come to that place where they will have their own relationship, their own interaction, their own encounters with God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That is the last blessing that I want to speak over each and every family represented here. May God visit your descendants in the name of Jesus. Come on, stretch out your hand before we get Pastor Gary to come up. I'm speaking this. May God be with you. May he drive fear from the generations. May he bless you. May he multiply your descendants. Bring you into a place of multiplication. And may your children serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. May your children have their own altars. May they have their own encounters with God. May they have their own prayer life. May they have their own walk with God. In the name of Jesus. I said in the name of Jesus. I said in the name of Jesus. So Father, as gatekeepers, we decree and declare every demonic trespasser as far as our children are concerned we rebuke you in the name of Jesus and we call them into the kingdom right now they will know Christ and they will know God they will serve him in the name of Jesus may this generation of blessings be our generation of blessings may the blessings of Abraham be ours for he's a father to us all as well so, Father, we connect ourselves to this Abrahamic blessing. 
that we shall see generational blessings. And we know, even as God is concerned, that the glory of the latter house will always be greater than the former. So we thank you that Isaac will walk in a greater grace than even Isaac. And Jacob will walk in a greater grace than even Isaac. Thank you, Father God, for your faithfulness to remember generations. Not just individuals that served you, but to remember generations. In Jesus' name, for our sake, visit them. Visit them. For the sake of the altars that we have raised before you, visit them and let them have their own altars. In Jesus' mighty name. As a pastor of this church, I speak that blessing over you and your house. In the mighty name of Jesus, somebody say amen. amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Pastor Gary, why don't you come and bless us and then we're going to, uh, I'm going to come and make a bit of an announcement and then we're going to close. Amen. Thank you so much, by the way. Thank you. Morning, family. He was stuck as family. <laughs> Not a thing you can do about it, is there? <laughs> uh, today is Father's Day. State the obvious. We honour the unsung heroes of our families. Whoever... Any clown can sorrow a child, but it takes a man to be a father, to be a dad. Right. To step into that void and to lead that child on the journey that Christ is leading him on. There's also an exclusive club you come into as a father. It's called Dad Jokes. <laughs> as a grandfather, you become a grandmaster, Adam. It's awesome. <laughs> <coughs> Now, I don't care if you're a biological dad, a stepdad, foster dad, adopted dad. But we're the only dad in a kid's life. It might be a niece or a nephew. It might be the kid over the back fence to, to kick a ball around with. Whatever. You're all in a place of a father. I'd like all you dads to stand up, please. Come on, show us your wares. And please stay standing, just for a moment. As I want to recognise you as not only the backbone of your, your homes, but of your church family. Do you know that this crazy world, you're the enemy. You're the enemy. A straight Bible-believing family man who covers his family in prayer under the covering of Jesus Christ, who comes to church on a Sunday morning, doesn't go to the footy or play golf. How unusual. But to me, you stand out. You're heroes in my books, all of you. See, to this world, they try to belittle who you are by calling it toxic masculinity, whatever that is. Because you're in the road of the feminist, alphabet, transformer, devil-worshipping, pedophile, socialist agendas of this world. You stand in the gap. <clears throat> so they attempt to belittle who you are and pull down what you stand for. The church is under attack everywhere on this planet. Our beliefs are under attack also everywhere on this planet. Every crazy group out there is trying to pull the mat from under you. Stand strong. Because as Pastor Jimmy said, when you stand with Christ, you don't stand alone. You stand from a position of victory. It's victory. Now we look at... If toxic masculinity was uh, such a poisonous thing, how come kids without a mum, without a dad, sorry, or a male role model in their life are four times more likely to commit a petty crime and way more likely to finish up in juvie. Go work that out. Because the strongest men aren't found in the gym pumping iron. The strongest men are found on their face before Jesus Christ, lifting up their families, 
covering their families. And that's you, fellas. All of you. You're the backbone of your neighbourhood, your workplace, your school communities and anywhere you choose to enter because with you, you take Christ and his influence, his morals, ethics and love which the world sorely needs. This world's going to hell in a basket, we know it, but for the blood of Jesus Christ. You are the window through which the covering of Christ comes to your families and to your communities. And I honour every single one of you. Now I'm going to ask something a little unusual now. I want those around you, please pray for these men right now. Cover them, lift them. It's a tough job. Get up. I don't care if you disturb the place, tip the chairs over. Don't care. Get up, pray for them, encourage them because by crikey they need it. Everything that's happening out there is tearing the legs off these blokes. Get behind them. Stand with them. Strengthen them. If there's a fellow with no one near him, go to him, please. All these men need lifting at this time. It's not an easy road out there. Lift them up, give them covering and protection in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. We honour you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. <coughs> Thank you, Jesus. I think that's a material Jesus. Help be held high in the name of Jesus Christ. As he takes his place in the forefront of his, his communities. Bless him and strengthen him and encourage him every day. In the name of Jesus we pray. We thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Everything that's in my gift, Father, upon every man in this church, upon all that he relates to, and even further, things that means books or blogs or whatever, or the internet, but Father, great multiplications of the labors of this most important thing. getting like Daniel, Daniel in that court of influence, but such wisdom, such help and counsel, 
such preparation Thank you, Mr. Lord. Khan was able to do things to really help the future. I pray that to my dear brother. Use him mightily, visit him in the right seasons, visit him in prayer and Father, the same, st I know it's such a wonderful man, but the same stature is in the natural with all these things. Let it rise in the spirit. Thank you, Father. We thank you, Father, for all these men. Bless them, cover, protect them. Strengthen and encourage them in Jesus' precious name. Men of God, you may sit down. Thank you. Now, that's just the introduction. I haven't started yet. For those who want to put a title, I call it Our Father. This is a healing. This is a forgiveness time. Pastor Chris, as she introduces us, uh, opened the service this morning, said, Father's Day is a cruel day to some people. We're going to address that right now. There's nothing easy about being a father, especially in our days. And we hear your pain. The fact is that dads through the ages have been throwing their hands up in the air for literally thousands of years because it's a, it's a journey that we all have to learn it's a path that we all have to a lot of us didn't have great role models fortunately for us this means we don't have to reinvent the wheel though some view scripture as ancient out of date text that has nothing to say about modern day life think again there's a lot to glean in it may actually change the way some of us think. For example, be the child's first teacher. Proverbs 22.6 says, it's our responsibility to train up a child in the way that he or she should go. Not the school, not the government, but you. And that means dads. To take that leadership role. Dads need to exemplify the good life in 2 Corinthians 3, 2 to 3. Scripture teaches that we are, who we are and how we live is like a letter from God. Our kids read that every day. Every day that influences their decisions and who they are by the example we give them. Provide for your family, 1 Timothy 5, 8. For those that are struggling to find work, don't beat yourself up. This idea is more about your heart and your desire. Being a father who provides covers more than just rent and food. As dads, it's our responsibility to make sure our family's needs are addressed. Across the board, that is. Be encouraged and look for ways to give to your family even when things are tight. And the biggest thing you can give them is your time. Number four, good dads discipline their children, Proverbs 13, 24. The one who loves their children, Scripture says, is careful to discipline them. This is also about proactive leadership in our homes. It's not mum's job. Take your role. Yes, mum is there to support you. Mum is there to walk, stand beside you. But dads take your leadership role. And five, dads spend time with their children, and it's not empty time, Deuteronomy 6, 6 to 9. The scriptures are clear that dads must engage their children in the kind of deep heart-to-heart -heart conversations that impart more than just facts, but teach wisdom. Schedule time for conversation walks, go out the back, kick a footy round, whatever it takes where you can connect with your child. It's family time that counts. And six, compassion is a dad characteristic. You think, really? The father has compassion for his children. Psalm 113 points out, because the Lord has compassion and that's his spirit that guides you. Another one is to put your money where your mouth is. Well, not in those exact terms, but James 1.22 instructs us that we're not only hearers, but doers of the word. Put your money where your mouth is. 
don't provoke your children Ephesians 6 to 4 the alternative the scriptures suggest is to raise them to be young people of faith children who know that their dads pray for them every day own a deep sense of love and security they just know it dads never give up on your kids in Luke 15 we see the prodigal son the father who never gave up hope ready to receive him back with open arms we can discipline hold account hold accountability but we never give up and dads pray for their kids 1 Chronicles 29 19 King David prayed for his son Solomon keep on top of it in your prayer life now some of our dads and grandfathers missed these lessons as they came through the first half of the last century went through a couple of world wars the depression we have Vietnam Korea and more recently Afghanistan these events hardened a couple of generations of men they had to be tough to survive <clears throat> they were the men don't cry and just shake hands generation a lot of us are the result of that generation but some of them never softened they witnessed things that no man should see they did things that man, no man should do and I look close to home to my own dad one of the rats at Brook at 17 he's also in Alamein New Guinea just to name a few only to return home to find that all the money he'd been sending home had been spent to find that all his swimming ribbons and horse riding ribbons and whatever had all been cut up all his clothes had been sold he was considered dead then a little later on to find out that uh, his mum had told his sisters that his dad had been killed and the new bloke was a replacement next time he came home he finds his uh, older sister who was like a mum to him he loved her greatly they died from a they believe a botched abortion now this just wasn't his case this was the upheaval that was in the world at that time touched such so many in that generation that for them to be able to connect in a way that all kids need was nearly impossible to us kids he was pretty hard but he loved our mum they were together for nearly 53 years married he's a brilliant man who could repair anything from tractors to clocks didn't matter teaching himself a radio course of electronics by correspondence how you do that I don't know he even had an influence in politics started a movement that brought down the New South Wales government at that time when they said oh he's just a cow cocky what would he know bad mistake so my view of a father was one of a disciplinary and a hard man a no-nonsense person who didn't suffer fools I didn't come to Christ till I was 42 yep I'm a late bloomer I lived a little on the other side of the track so those people that say you wouldn't understand just try me you'd be surprised what I've done and been there For example Parramatta Road in Sydney used to be in my early days 35 mile an hour limit now it's the main artery out of Sydney heading west there were no freeways then it was just Parramatta Road she was a wild road Friday night was always a good night to head into town and go to a movie or go to a show or something whatever on Friday night we met up with some bloke in a hotted up Cooper S we dragged him on Parramatta Road every time we found a light coming up you back off till it goes red you've got the front line we dragged him I flogged him but anyway I got up to speeds of 115 mile an hour that's 80 miles an hour over the speed limit I shouldn't be here something had gone pear-shaped good night nurse 
However, I know and I can map the times in my life when I can see God had his hand and steered me through all this stupidity and my own foolishness. I didn't know him. But I look back and that was you, God, wasn't it? What were you doing then? That's awesome. How'd you do that? There's some cool stuff. He was protecting me from a foolish and charting a course for my life that I didn't understand. I can map out 18 times and I should be dead. Should be dead. Most of them involve motor cars or water. Not good. But my view of the Father, I couldn't get my head around. And in John 10, 27, he says, My sheep, listen to my name. Listen to my voice, sorry. I know them and they follow me. 28, I give them eternal life and they shall, they shall never perish. No one can snatch them from my hand. And 29, my Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. And 30, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. I struggle with this. I understood Jesus. I'm sort of, yeah, I can, this guy's cool. But I don't know about this dad bloke. He really rocked my boat. John 14, 8 to 9, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it's enough for us. And Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long that you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. The same attributes of love, grace, patience, forgiveness, etc., are found in our Father. <clears throat> our fathers were far from perfect, but we have to forgive and move forward. We have to put those things behind us because they control us as much as it controls their life. <clears throat> as Jesus said in Colossians 3.13, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. Another translation, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against anyone, even as Christ forgave you, so also forgive. We have to forgive these blokes. Even in the Lord's Prayer, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Over and over he tells us. Mark eleven twenty five, and then <clears throat> whenever you stand praying, forgive. And if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven can forgive you your trespasses. We have to forgive. Matthew 6, 14, 15. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their, their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. I could go on and on, but you get the picture. To be forgiven, we must first forgive. I don't like it, take it up with him. Not my words. Forgiveness is important not only for the other person but for ourselves more so. See, in a lot of cases, the person you don't forgive doesn't even know you're thinking of them. They have no idea that we're really going to about this person. They don't know. There are a couple of things happen when we don't forgive. We become consumed by it in a way that it will make us very ugly on the inside, which comes out of us spiritually, emotionally and physically, usually in some form of sickness. Resentment of the other person sets in and it's a very ugly lodger. The second thing is we're judging the other person and getting the road of God working in their life. Because we've set ourselves up as job, uh, uh, judge and jury. We've said, God, I've got this, and we take it away from him. We don't believe the other person deserves to be forgiven. That's a bad mistake. Or that God can make any good out of them. Wrong choice again. We can forgive, 
But don't forget, we learn through these things, but we grow above them. Through a transformation in Christ, rise above the event and get it behind us, move forward. Because Paul tells us in Romans 3.23, all have sinned, underline all, to big A, and fall short of the glory of God. All. And there's no little sin and big sin. We're all equal. Many of our fathers, grandfathers, uncles, brothers have hurt us in unimaginable ways. But I want to tell you, there's no one who can't be saved and forgiven. And there's no pain which God the Father can't cure. We just have to trust him and surrender to him. Place it at the foot of the cross and leave it there. Today I'm giving you a chance to put this all behind. A lot of us are carrying bits and pieces that we shouldn't be. We're carrying judgments we shouldn't be. We're carrying unforgiveness we shouldn't be. We're carrying hurts we don't need to be. But firstly, as a dad, as a grandfather, I want to apologise and ask forgiveness for any person here that a man has hurt on behalf of men. It's not what we're placed here for. It's not who God wired us up to be. But this world bent, the outcomes. And I want to ask your forgiveness on behalf of men that have hurt you, whoever it might be. I'm going to open up the altar in a moment. I've got two dads in the house to come and help me pray. We will pray with every single person. If you're carrying an unforgiveness and you want to let it go, I'm going to ask you to come out. If there's someone in your life you need to step away from, the feelings and the thoughts that tie you down every day, we'll pray for you. If you want to ask forgiveness as a father, you feel you haven't come up quite to measure, a little bit short of the mark let's clean the air today let's ask God to release it if you want to give thanks for the dad you have or had who was a perfect biblical dad as good as you can be on this planet I'd also love to pray with you or if you're just like a daddy hug we're here No one knows which categories you fall into. There's nothing to be said unless you say it. Makes sense. Don't be shy. Let's release this and walk out of here knowing Father's Day is a different day. Also, I want you to look at when you get out of here if you haven't. Go see your dad. Or go ring your dad. I don't care if you haven't spoken to for 10 years. Go do it. It's not for him, it's for you. Because it lets things go. And we need to let it go. Otherwise it controls us, it consumes us. So if you feel you want prayer to let things go, please come forward. I'll ask Pastor Barry and Pastor Bill to come and help me. <clears throat>